Right, and that brings us to our next and the final presentation for this stage. So let's invite Derek on the stage. Let's see if we can have him here right now. Hello, Derek. How are you doing today? Doing good. And uh, I guess we have better weather here than in Seattle and uh, Portland, which is uh, crazy to see. Where are you based? San Francisco. Oh, OK. Very good. Um, all right. So without further ado, Derek today is going to be talking about um, how you can align your API metrics to business values. Um, and feel free to ask questions. I'm going to be reading the, the uh, I'm going to be reading them later. And just after the presentation, we have a closing remarks and an after party. So make sure to join that as well, because there is going to be prizes and opportunity of networking. With that, Derek, stage is yours and take it away. Cool, and I appreciate uh, being here at API Days. I'm going to be speaking on how to align your API metrics to your business goals. But before stepping through that, a little bit about me. I'm the CEO of Mosif, an API analytics company. And I love discussing API strategy, product strategy, and analytics. And little known fact about myself, I love IPAs. So I'm sure I'll be grabbing one later today. APIs are becoming products, but that means you need to think about them in products in itself. So that means think about your roadmap, your strategy, walking through your architectural design, and the rest of the process before you get to iterating and deprecating an endpoint. With that said, most of the metrics up to this point has focused on the infrastructure side. Things like SLAs, uptime, latency, errors per minute. There's nothing here that looks like business value or dollars flowing through an API. So how do you actually align these to your uh, business goals? Well, we. If you look at the mobile apps and the web apps, you know, just a few decades ago, usually you look at three different categories of metrics. The first is around adoption metrics. You know, how do people sign up and use your platform? The second is around engagement and usage. Now, this might not necessarily mean number of API calls because that doesn't actually tie to the business value itself. You may actually take five API calls to create one single transaction that the developer makes to uh, interact with your platform. And lastly, there's the retention metrics. Now, how long do people stick with your platform? Are they gaining value over a long period of time? Or do they churn? Do they move over to the next uh, competitor? And why is it so hard to actually align these metrics? And why is it so hard for your developers to start using your platform? Well, first of all, developers are skeptical, right? They don't like to trust uh, non-technical people, especially sales folks. And they hate doing integration work. They usually have a lot of different items on their plate. And they also want to build things themselves. With that said, it's not just about developers themselves. There's a lot of other parties that is trying to get value out of this platform. So if you look at the, your typical developer that signs up and starts integrating with your API, they're doing this not just for themselves, but to create some business value at the organization. This could be by setting up uh, uh, payments or, or text messages or something else with that platform. But then there's other pieces too here. There's the value to engineering. And this isn't necessarily just running those payments through your API. It's also how much time they can save by uh, purchasing or using this platform versus building it themselves. And then there's a the value to leadership, whether it's compliance, metrics, or other things that they get by purchasing or using this API platform. And each one of these three areas is what I'm going to focus on during this uh, presentation. So let's first walk through what we consider product adoption and how do you best understand this. First, before you can walk through adoption, you need to understand what is actually creating value here? So if you're an e-commerce platform, it might be a checkout or making a purchase. With that said, if you're a data platform, it might be, uh, you know, what is your match rate? Is it 100%? Is it 50%? Is it 75%? And notice every single time I'm speaking to value here, I'm not calling it an endpoint, you know, a, a lookup or, or, or a query or anything like that, right? It's really what the customer is getting out of this platform. And this boils down to when we start creating these conversion funnels or activation funnels. One of the biggest things to think about is how long does it take to uh, get integrated and set up with the platform? And how long does it take for them to realize value? In this case, we have a four stage funnel. The first is what we consider a page visit. So going to your website, exploring around, looking at your documentation, and they sign up. They might get stuck in your onboarding flow, you know, kicking the tires. And then before, they, before you know it, they make that first hello world. And again, that hello world is not just a single API call. It may be five API calls, especially if it takes five API calls to make a single payment transaction 
or send a single text message. And that's something you need to consider as you start building these funnels. And lastly, you know, how do you think about value that they get? Sometimes we call this time to value. And that might be the first you know, $100 of, of payment transactions going through your platform or the first 100 text messages being sent. In this case, this is a cross-platform funnel. So on the blue side here, you see these are web actions, right? And these might be tracked through a, a web analytics platform such as an amplitude or a segment. But then we have the other side here, which is the API platform, right? And it's really, really important to tie these two things together and to have a good attribution model, right? Because you might have one developer sign up and they're the ones who are you know, exploring your documentation or interested in your product, but they might pass that off to someone else. And that other person is the one that, who's actually doing the integration or doing the implementation. So how do we build a funnel here? Right? On the first step here, which is step one, the red box, we have a user action of sign up. Right? This is the first step before they really get started with your platform itself. Then the second box here, we're looking at the payment transaction. In this case, they only need to do it one time, and that's what we consider a hello world. The last step here, we're saying they did it over 100 times. right? Because if you just make a single payment and they uh, never come back, you know, what's the point? Now, how do you get people to the next step? This is where guiding developers or your customers is really critical for them to uh, get to the next step in their customer journey. One of the ways to do this is by sending out different emails at different points in, in those different stages. For example, if someone makes a single payment transaction, but they didn't get to the next step, let them know, you know, why is it important for them to you know, move through forward with this trial or this PLC? If they never even made that first payment transaction, you might wanna guide them and let them know, hey, this is how easy it is to get integrated or set up. Point them to maybe some SDK documentation or, or some API documentation. But let's talk about the meat of why is someone using this platform? It's not just around the adoption piece, it's so that they're fully engaged and get some value out of it. But how do you actually measure API engagement? You know, a bad metric to look at is request per second. I mean, you could easily have a single developer that just pings your API thousands or even millions of times, even though they're not getting any value, right? The next thing here is, is weekly active tokens. That's a better metric, sure. I mean, you can track that. With that said, what if you create a new token every single week? Now you don't have a good accurate measurement of the true number of active users using your platform. So the best way to measure engagement is through weekly active users. How many different accounts or developers are using your platform on a daily or weekly basis? For APIs, usually it's weekly, um, given that not every single person will be using your platform on a daily basis. But now how do we think about what is considered engagement? We'll walk through that in a second here. But first we need to add some attributes to understand who is accessing your platform. If, if your uh, platform is used by B2B companies or, or other enterprise, you might add things like the name or the industry that they're in. What is the primary use case and how do they discover you? Was it through ads? Was it through um, sales activities or through other uh, means? With those additional attributes, now you can fully understand how to break this data down by company name, by username, by industry that they're in, in other ways. But that said, just by the fact that they're using your API doesn't necessarily correspond to value, right? In this case, we actually want to understand what are they getting out of it, right? So going back to the e-commerce platform example that we mentioned earlier, we might want to look at the categories that are out of stock that a person sees versus, you know, they were always able to get 100% in stock. Similarly, if it's a data API, it goes back to that match rate. Is it 100%? Is it 50%? The way to do this is by looking at the payloads that is traveling over your platform or over your API. Now we can actually build out a full chart showing these are the number of daily active users or weekly active users that's able to see you know, a, a, a query that is unavailable versus available versus out of stock. Very relevant for an e-commerce platform. And notice this is a much better way to look at your engagement versus just number of queries per second or number of requests per second. And if we go back to what we mentioned earlier, which is tying that back to different customer attributes, now we can have a full understanding of which customers are seen unavailable versus out of stock the most. And this might help you uh, prioritize 
that customer outreach. Folks who might be struggling with their API versus folks who are seeing the most value and ready for the next stage or next phase in your customer journey. The last piece here is how to understand retention. Just because someone is using an API for a couple of days doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're a long-term customer that you're gonna be able to uh, grow with them. One way to think about product retention is just like what you would see in, in a web app or mobile app. This is by a cohort retention analysis. In this case, we see that the retention curve is flat. This is, this is a really great way to think about retention. It means you don't have a leaky boat. If that retention curve is going down to zero, that basically means most folks who are signing up or using your platform, they stop using your API just after a matter of a few weeks. Sometimes this can actually go back up and this is what we call the smile curve. You'll notice in this curve that most of the folks will drop off after the first day or first week. And that's pretty typical for most platforms. You're gonna have folks that try to integrate your API, either they struggle or they find it's not right for them. And that's okay. It's up to you to set up some type of drip campaign or some type of engagement campaign to just nurture those customers and wait for them to you know, set up and, and move forward when the time is right for them. But it's more important to actually dig into your retention to see what's driving that. And you can actually uh, break this down by programming language, different versions that they're using, features that they're using, or any number of other attributes. For example, you might notice that your C-sharp SDK has a much lower retention curve than your Java SDK. That means you might want to take a look at why is it that your C-sharp SDK is lower? Is it because there is performance issues? Is there errors? It just doesn't have the right feature set for your customers? Another way to actually help with retention is showing the business value directly to your end users. Just because a developer who's integrating your API sees value doesn't mean their business users do. One way to do this is through what we call embedded dashboards, showing engagement metrics, usage metrics, transaction volume, that type of stuff, so they understand what they're purchasing. Otherwise, the API can look like a back block, a black box to a business user. One last tip is keep customers informed of different things happening with the API, whether it's around quota limits, deprecations. You really need to understand about your APIs as a product lifecycle, from start of pushing on a new feature to the end, which is shutting off access. Don't surprise your developers or don't surprise your customers. If there's one takeaway from this presentation is optimize for value creation and measure that value rather than just the request per second or the, or the errors per minute. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for the presentation, first of all. Um, yes, we do have a question here. OK, so the question is, is your platform able to support kind of a use case scenarios, which is, for example, um, invoicing a customer is not exactly just a single API call, but it's more like, you know, you create, you get some data, and then you create a report, and then you create an invoice request. And that, that for, the, for, for, for somebody, it's kind of a, it's a, a logical use case scenario that, that compose on multiple API calls. And people were asking if you're able to do that with your current platform. Yeah, so th that is uh, one of the reasons why we created this platform. Um, and one of the reasons why we like to advocate for thinking about APIs as products and, and creating the right metrics around that is, as you mentioned, you might take five different transactions or five different API calls to create what is considered a business transaction, to send that single payment or to create that single order. In that case, you know, just because you're tracking all those different API calls you're making, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean they're creating value or they're getting value out of it. In fact, it might be the opposite. You know, if you see a person take 100 you know, API calls to do one single business transaction, that could mean there, there's some optimizations that you can make, try and condense or, or, or make those a little bit smaller. Yeah, yeah. I guess in that case, you can probably create kind of a optimized specific endpoint that's going to fulfill the entire thing. OK. Second question is a little bit more technical and probably more a curiosity. Like, um, it seems like your platform is also supporting GraphQL. And they were asking, you know, from your standpoint, which one is easier to work with to understand scenarios and grabbing the data? Who's offering a better tooling to start off the job? 
One of the great things about GraphQL is it gives so much power to your clients and to your customers, especially if they have very specific needs and query patterns. With that said, you know, when you give so much power to those folks, then become, you also have great responsibility to track and understand where are they struggling and where are those errors. For us, I mean, we do support GraphQL and we also support REST and, and a few other um, formats or protocols. Um, but with that said, you know, when, when you think about GraphQL, it's like the SQL versus NoSQL debate, right? It's not like a one size fit all. If you have a lot of different entities such as an e-commerce platform or something like that, you might wanna think about GraphQL because then your customers or your clients can query in many different ways. With that said, if you're providing an analytics API or a logging API, it doesn't necessarily make sense for you to you know, provide that GraphQL API and actually come up with some other language that fits more within the, the needs of the API itself. Okay, then let's see what we have next. We have another one for you. What was the most interesting metric you understood by using your own platform to monitor your own platform? <laughs> ah. I, I love this one. Um, I think the most important thing that we like to track internally is uh, how long does it take to activate or get integrated with Mosif? Is it a week? Is it 15 minutes? And then also understanding you know, which marketing channels or which sources is driving those best customers, right? Is it you know, from ad spend that we have? Is it from sales? Is it certain industry segments that we're targeting? I'm um, looking at the activation funnel and then slicing it you know, many different ways is a good way for you to understand where to invest more um, money and, and, and time. Yeah. All right. Uh, let me see if we have some other questions. I think I'm, we're out of it at the moment. Uh, no, but since we still have a little bit of time, um, I think I can probably ask you, uh, ask you one. So um, back to the question, you know, what what is easier for you to implement in terms of either a classical REST, classical REST API or that way of GraphQL? Um, I'm assuming your your people are, are are exposing a public API, and so what what kind of API are you exposing? Are you using GraphQL or or are you just exposing a regular HTTP API? For ourselves? For ourselves, it's a, a standard REST API. No, you, you, your, pu your public API, if you have any. Yeah, so our public API is a REST API. Um, mm -hmm. We do create, uh, we have a couple of different DSLs to create custom queries, um, mostly because our customers also want to uh, create very complex dashboards and uh, integrate with other systems, um, whether it's billing systems, uh, systems for, for the CRM and that type of stuff. In that case, just GraphQL is very hard to make work with analytics, given the nature of the queries. Um, with that said, if I was building an e-commerce platform, uh, I may choose GraphQL um, because I want to do a lot of different joins and, and that type of stuff. Let's focus on um, the actual aggregations themselves. All right. We have a last question that just came last minute, and it's again, it's the curiosity with your platform. The most absurd or fascinating use metric that you've been seeing so far in the platform or something that stands out or any horror stories? Hmm, most fascinating or scary? Well, you know, one of the biggest things is uh, many times you'll have a customer that will unintentionally abuse your API. And that's one thing to always be thinking about. Um, it's not, you know, intentional abuse. You know, they, they may just, you know, deploy a faulty integration or you know, using it incorrectly. And that's something to always be tracking, you know, when a customer has a big spike in usage or something that goes uh, all right. And being able to reach out to that person, you know, make them successful and not have a big surprise, whether it's it's a bill or, you know, something else or especially running into rate limits. You know, no one wants to have a surprise where they thought a transaction went through, but it actually didn't. Right. All right. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. All right. It seems like, you know, we're out of questions here, so I'm not going to hold you for more time. Um, I want to thank you one more time for being with us today. It's been a pleasure. And for the audience, if you have any more questions, the chat is still open. The, the speakers will be here also uh, later today and tomorrow. Thank you very much, Derek. Thank you for being here. Thank you very us. much.